uh, Kauliki or islands are. This is specifically the Kona side. And um, Peterson et al. estimated, for example, discharge from just Honoko Harbor was about 12,000 cubic meters per day. Um, and for scale, for reference, I uh, converted manual stream uh, mean um, flow um, is uh, 23,000 cubic meters per day. Um, so we have half of manual stream discharging continuously. For example, from just from this restricted harbor, we have many, many more sources along the coastline. And. Uh, they also, um, so uh, Johnston et al, they also looked at um, the plume structure, the groundwater is fresher or brackish, but it's less dense than the seawater, so it flows on top of seawater. So we have this brackish plume that travels on the, the surface of the ocean, and it's colder and it's fresher. So if we look at, for example, its nutrient concentration, so if we go from the ocean environment, we go across the scientific gradient and even into the terrestrial environment, um, <coughs> we see that we have all these high nutrient <coughs> concentrations in the terrestrial environment and low open ocean concentrations. But the SGD is then really bringing in all these nutrients to, to the coastline. And uh, <coughs> So building on that, my particular interest is in quantifying groundwater discharge. I use um, not just these direct measurement chambers, but um, uh, because they are so laborious, we really like geochemical tracer methods that cover a larger area and, and can integrate the signature. And so I use radon, and this is a cartoon um, drawn by Kim Mayfield, uh, a student that just graduated last semester. Um, Radon is a noble gas, it's inert, so that's why all these comments that um, radon doesn't like to bind chemically with anything else. And that's, the advan that's what we take advantage of because in the subterranean asteroid there's potential for a lot of chemical transformations, but radon is not subject to that. It also doesn't matter what salinity the groundwater has, it will still get enriched with radon in the same um, in the same way. And so we use radon, we measure coastal radon concentrations and do mass budgets to try to figure out how much groundwater had to flow into the coastal environment um, um, and to really quantify groundwater discharge. And the uh, first work I would like to uh, give you um, an idea about is um, <clears throat> the one by um, Jackie Kelly, who was Craig Glenn's uh, PhD student, and we did a project together in Pearl Harbor. She used thermal imagery, so again, um, on these, these are the different locks within Pearl Harbor. The colors indicate temperatures, so the colder temperatures are where colder groundwater flows out to, um, um, to the bay. Um, to Pearl Harbor, and um, we, the lines here indicate radon concentrations. Um, <clears throat> so we see some areas that have really high radon, but pretty much any color that's above this very dark blue means there is groundwater discharge. And uh, indeed our areas align very well where we see high radon, that's also where thermal imagery identified cold water, colder groundwater plumes, and um, we converted all these radon surveys into groundwater fluxes, so what you have here, um, which is probably un unreadable for you because of the low font, what we have here is now actually plotted um, groundwater discharge rates per meter of coastline. So we uh, constructed the, the, the balance for all of uh, Pearl Harbor and um, the results indicate that fresh spring discharge accounts to about 280 cubic meters per day. Um, total discharge is 330 cubic meters per day from which point sources, so individual springs, account for 18,000. Um, nitrogen fluxes, phosphorus fluxes, silicate fluxes, they are all um, very significant in terms of the budgets for, for Pearl Harbor. Um, another study um, <coughs> that we did is in Mauna Loa Bay. And I plotted salinity here um, to really show you that um, while salinity is nice and conservative, it's not really unique to SGD. First of all, because the groundwater that discharges is not zero salinity, so we don't start with zero. Plus, we also have surface input streams that bring in low salinity water. So while this shows a nice um, 
variability in, um, along the coastline for salinity, it's really the radon that gives away where groundwater discharges to the bay. So, for example, Black Point is a significant source of high radon water um, or groundwater. This area aligns very nicely with the low salinity where we don't have any streams. Um, this also right here. Um, <coughs> where there is no stream. So radon is really unique to groundwater. It does, uh, streams are not enriched in radon. Um, one area that really shows up with radon but not with salinity is um, Hawaii Kai. That, that was interesting. So just concentrating in these two regions, for example, we looked at how variable groundwater discharges over time. For example, location A is black point here. We put up a time series radon measurement in the coastline. That's the blue line and the red is seawater, so sea level. Um, and again, the same tidally influenced SGD signature, the tidal dynamics. So at low tide, we have high radon, therefore also high groundwater discharge uh, because the hydraulic gradient is larger in the coastal aquifer. Um, and location B is Vailupe, where we again observe the same tidal, um, tidal dynamics and um, significant groundwater fluxes. And at Black Point, um, <coughs> There are individual springs that we could um, find, identify, that, that are discharging right at the coastline. So we sampled those. They had salinity ranging from 2 to 5, depending on the tide. And we measured nutrient concentrations in them. And they were really, really high. So we have total nitrogens as much as 3 to um, almost 400 micromolar. Um, and of course, as that um, groundwater then mixes with ocean water, we have um, um, nutrient concentrations that decrease due to biological uptake, losses by mixing, and we also have some locally recycled nutrients. So that's one of the reasons why we worry about groundwater discharge. It brings in huge amounts of uh, nutrients and might affect uh, coastal biogeochemis uh, biogeochemistry. And one specific example um, that I would like to talk just a little bit about is the Lahaina Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, for which um, <coughs> Again, this is the collaboration for the whole group. Um, um, we had a report that came out um, a couple months ago. Um, the people that live around this region and, and, and other organizations suspected or blamed the wastewater treatment plant um, that there are springs, coastal springs, or under submarine springs in that region that discharge water that they suspect is influenced by the wastewater that's injected um, uh, at this uh, wastewater treatment plant. So again, we are in Kahekili right here uh, <coughs> in West Maui, and this is the wastewater treatment plant really in a close proximity to the coastline. Um, we mapped all the, the spring uh, or the vents that we could identify in the, in the coastline. Um, <clears throat> so there were a couple or several spring clusters or vent clusters that were identified. And um, so they were sampled for nutrients, radon, and all the geochemical tracer signature. Um, this is a, these are photographs of these little seeps. Some of them you can make out better, others, this is actually a movie. Maybe you will be able to see it. Um, so we have discharge happening right here. So all these images were taken by Megan Daler, um, who, who did uh, a, a lot of legwork for this project in, in diving and taking samples. So um, <clears throat> she actually made maps of these seeps. So um, all these little flags indicate where um, she identified a, a seep. These seep clusters are the ones that uh, behaved chemically a little bit differently. They were warmer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so those were the ones that, that we really focused on for sampling. And so um, among others, the objective was to inject a dye into um, a well that um, into which the wastewater, the treated water is injected and see if that dye surfaces from these springs. And so uh, <clears throat> this is Christine who was uh, among other students putting in long hours to in, um, um, mixing in the dye into the injectate and um, 
and so the, the seeps were sampled individually and indeed uh, the dye was recovered in the coastal area in these, in these seeps and Bob Whittier um, did a lot of work on modeling and interpreting um, these profiles and one information that he needed for this was groundwater discharge, how much water really discharges through these springs and again we use radon so we set up stations about these springs, uh, uh, we inserted these um, rods, piezometers so that we can really sample the water before it discharges and mixes with ocean water and <clears throat> so we use these to sample for radon and we also had these surface stations where we sampled for radon and we used radon as um, the tracer to estimate groundwater discharge um, and the South Cluster and North Cluster are the ones that had most of the dye emerging and so those had significant groundwater discharge flow and then Joe Frackle worked on identifying how much of that or quantifying how much of that could have been uh, coming from um, <coughs> the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but we actually did a survey, a radon survey, along the whole coastline because we wanted to see how it compares to areas north and south of um, these suspect springs and we found that indeed other, are, other areas ju had just as much or not, if not more groundwater discharge um, <clears throat> so to really put this in context we found that um, are these uh, springs that really had the dye in them, so coming from the wastewater injection site, uh, different. So they had um, lower pH than open ocean, so that's kind of um, a, a negative impact on the environment, but most importantly their phosphorus concentration was much higher. Nitrogen was not significantly higher actually at all from, from all the other from all these other areas um, that we identified as also source of high groundwater. Um, and so again this study has significance in that we identified the linkage between um, the injection and the seeps, the coastal seeps, um, but of course it has to be investigated what is really the effect of uh, this, um, these seeps on the coastal environment which we did not go into but I, I wanted to show you that there are actually indeed some studies on how groundwater discharge affects um, coastal environments specifically. Megan Daler with Celia Smith did a study in which they uh, put out algae and um, looked at the algae nitrogen signature and um, indeed the highest nitrogen 15 signature showed up wherever um, uh, a, um, a suspected discharge of, of um, uh, wastewater injected or, or um, reclaimed water injected um, happened um, and so of, of course there's, there has to be more studies done to really in, um, identify what are the consequences of this discharge to the coastal zone. Okay, so I take you from Wahaina to a much more pristine environment which is in Kihol Bay on the corner side. Again on the left side we have um, a thermal imagery that shows cold groundwater discharge along the coastline and the plume as it propagates seaward. Um, this is from Adam Johnson's thesis and then more recently Christine, Christine Waters has been working on utilizing radon um, to look at the dynamics of groundwater discharge and quantifying groundwater discharge. So we use radon as a tracer again this is a coastal survey so we check along the coastline and measure coastal radon concentrations wherever we see um, high radon levels uh, that's an indication that we have groundwater discharge and actually the areas align very well with the thermal imagery again the advantage of radon that we can actually put together Sorry put together a mass balance um, to calculate um, the discharge and for, for this side again we have a lot of fresh water discharge although the aquifer there is far from this simple um, homogeneous layer of sand as, as uh, on this schematics um, and, and so we were really curious in what are the conduits in, in, in Kona that drive that, that uh, lead groundwater to the ocean. And so um, right at the coastline uh, we of course try to sample the groundwater before it enters the ocean but it's really hard to, to get any sampling rods in at any depth, any significant depth. 
So we turn to a different tool, a physical tool, geophysical tool. You see a cable laying here on the ground which has electrodes attached every a meter and a half on it and what we do with it is um, it sends electric signal to the ground so we are looking at a subsurface um, so the scale here is going downward in below ground um, <coughs> And what we see is the electric resistivity of the substrate, the subterranean substrate. So where we have high resistivity, that's uh, indicated by the red colors, that means that's probably a layer that either is not saturated with water, or if then it's saturated by fresh water. And then whatever layer is saturated by ocean water, which is conductive, um, is, is, um, is in blue. Um, of course, this static image doesn't give you a true information because this just might be a rock that's not saturated by water and that's why it's distinct. So the trick to this method is to really look at a time series of the same of, of, uh, of measurements. So we have this cable laying along the coastline for uh, a whole tidal period and every hour we measure the resistivity of the subterranean substrate. So on the top figure right here you see we, we just jumped from low, uh, high to low tide. Uh, we are going towards high tide and you see that indeed the resistivity in the subterranean environment changes and it got the most red when we jumped to low tide because that's when the subterranean ester responded and the fresh water really um, uh, flowed more or m much more than at high tide from the coastal aquifer. So just to select the high and low tide image you see there's huge difference in resistivity and that's because these are apparently conduits that drive fresh water to the marine environment. And so this also helps us understand how tidal influence groundwater discharge is, where, in which way it flows. So it's not a uniform, nice wedge. We have conduits that lead groundwater into the surface. Um, <coughs> and then along the same line, um, in the surface, we observe the same tidal trend. So besides doing a survey, we also set up time series measurements of radon in this environment. And what we see again, red is water level, um, blue is radon, and the green color is salinity. Whenever we have low tide, we have much higher radon, lower salinity, so that's where most of groundwater discharge happens. Indeed, this figure shows groundwater discharge um, <coughs> how uh, tidally dynamic it is. And then we also found that um, we wanted to do a seasonal study, wet versus dry season, um, and, and whenever we did a measurement, the numbers just came out always so different. So that's kind of frustrating that you can just you cannot just come and do one measurement and say this is my groundwater discharge um, as you do for average models or anything. You really have to do time series monitoring. And so we got motivated to construct this autonomous um, instrument. Um, it's called an SGD sniffer. So this is a instrument that can measure radon. This is what's housed in this black case that is then attached right here. So it's a gamma spectrometer. It can measure radon and um, for example our hope is that within Kiholo Bay um, we can produce a record like this. So this is again radon uh, I don't have water level or salinity plotted in here, but this, is, this goes on for a couple of weeks and you see that we have a huge changes in the baseline of radon and also in the magnitude of the peak, so groundwater discharge really is very highly variable in, in this environment. This was actually measured in, uh, near Heia where the, the buoy is sitting right now. I'm waiting for the government to spin up and issue permits so that it can actually go right here to Kiholo Bay, but this is the record that, that we hope to reproduce there. And so, so that we can really look at groundwater discharge in a bigger context in, uh, compared to climate data and also sea level data. And then um, really tease out for Hawaii which one is m more important, what, how important the individual um, uh, sources of water or, or sea level change are. And then for my last slide I have a little bit of different flavor um, here uh, looking at groundwater in the coastal environment but not in the marine environment. So um, 
Uh, we also study inclined ponds and fish ponds. We want to understand groundwater discharge dynamics into them. For example, in the Kona coast, we looked at several inclined ponds. We used radon and water level and salinity to really understand how much water flows through um, through the inclined ponds. These are coastal landlocked water bodies. They are uh, really a low spot in topography that fills with groundwater. And because um, <clears throat> We have, we have a tidal range plus uh, that, that forces water back and forth into the aquifer, plus we have the, the, the hydraulic gradient naturally in the, in the aquifer. We have a lot of groundwater discharge through these ponds. And so um, in one study, we looked at groundwater discharge into the pond over time. The solid lines indicate flow from the coastal side towards upstream and the dashed lines indicate from upstream flow of groundwater from upstream to the downstream region so the water flows through the pond. We found that depending on their size they can have as much as a couple of cubic meters of groundwater discharging to them um, in a day. Um, and then for fish ponds, specific study that we did was in Lucas Springs, so that was John, uh, Joe um, Kennedy's um, bachelor's thesis. Um, Lucas Spring is an interesting story. Um, in the 80s, it was thriving, it, it was maybe a meter deep, it had a couple species of fish living in it, um, it was fresh, um, and over time um, it actually disappeared the spring stopped flowing um, and um, actually the highway uh, widening project uh, um, that happened on the road, uh, the highway that leads to Hawaii Kai. Yes, thank you, that one. <laughs> Um, it was blamed for, for, the, for the problem. Um, indeed, um, they found that a lot of groundwater seeps into the sewer lines, and so they decided to uh, rehabilitate the sewer lines, which they did in October 2010. And so we did measurements of groundwater discharge into this pond in April 2010, and then after the rehabilitation project in April, uh, I'm sorry, March 2011, and indeed the groundwater discharge significantly improved after the, the remediation. So this is the pond again in April 2011. So the pond is back. Um, anyway, so this is just another example of what other kinds of studies we do with, with groundwater discharge and, and groundwater flow. And so I would like to acknowledge, um, again, the Hydrology and Coastal Groundwater Research Group and the other funding agencies, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Did you make any effort to measure the radon concentrations from groundwater? Of course. Especially yes. in Hawaii for different source of groundwater. Yes, yes, that's... I didn't see it. Maybe I forgot. I didn't show any of those results. Um, but yes, of course, we always measure the groundwater radon concentrations that again those can change between a well or the coastline so we always measure wells also but but the coastal groundwater for its signature. Um, How did your measurement uh, reveal the radon concentration mm -hmm. in relation to what you got from Massachusetts? Those uh, uh, hydrogeological conditions quite different. So over there they have a radon Redon Bridge, a groundwater. Over here in Hawaii, do you see the same level of concentration? No, no. So radon concentrations in, in Wakiot Bay, for example, would be up to 1,000 dpm, decays per minute per liter. So those are the units we use. Um, here in Hawaii, it's more like 100, 200. But again, ocean has 0.5. So this is still a huge concentration gradient that, that we can use. Despite it's being 10 times less than Massachusetts, it's still um, more than two orders of magnitude higher than in the ocean. Sure. But we do have a variability, of course, in Hawaii, in radon. Yeah. 
it, you showed one figure that uh, gave an overall uh, estimate of how much leakage there was for each of the islands, but have, have you developed maps that show uh, specifically where the uh, highest volumes are? So, right, those um, methods are based on a watershed scale. And so the thermal imagery, for example, is one of the methods that can um, uh, map large swath of the coastline. The read on um, uh, surveys can reveal where this happens because otherwise you would really need to get a very good picture of what's the underground geology so you can construct a model that can really tell you which way the, the groundwater is channeled. And unfortunately we are not there so we use these um, other techniques. And so we are working on covering more and more of the coastline in Hawaii. Henrietta, what was the uh, method that Pat Shea used for measuring the submarine groundwater discharge? So there, uh, I believe that was the GIS layer based uh, or GIS based water budget. They had precipitation, they had evapotranspiration rates, so simply just... It was a model. It's a it model GIS. Measurement. No, 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 okay. no, no, it's a model. Right, so, yeah. So it needs verified. Yes, and they are, the USGS is working on it. They are actually um, constructing water budget models as we speak, now that they are not furloughed anymore. So they are updating it. Okay. I was just wondering um, if you could use the information about um, the for, uh, forcing function, the temporal variability of the forcing function, say, uh, say the tides, and the uh, variation in the response, either the flux or that nice um, resistivity I wonder if you could use that information to infer something about the hydrologic process, the permeability, or the, or the maybe even the, um, the structure of the aquifers. So. Um in collaboration with Ali, so he and his students and, and postdocs are constructing models which we try to come up with the same, see cross calibrate or, or see how well we can we can match our, our results. Um, but my, my goal is, for example, for the Kiholo Bay study, is once we have this longer time series measurement and we, we can really relate to more um, climate and, and sea level changes and ho hopefully have some predictive abilities then predict it better. Yes, and, and so we are working on that. Well, I guess the difficulty is uh, the scale of heterogeneity. So we can show some trends, it looks nice, but you know, if you look at much of the smaller scale, well, it's probably too heterogeneous to model reliably at the coastline. Yes, and uh, like for example, the trend just shows that you have a uh, higher discharge at so low tides and vice versa. We can choose that, but you know, for field work, it shows multiple peaks, for example, because of heterogeneous. And I tell him that her mission life to me, model out, look bad. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> in, in one of the sniffers, where you used to model the and measure the radiant concentration, so what is the reason for the varying magnitudes of radiant? I assume the, the subsurface water flow would be more or less steady, sort of thing. But the magnitude of variation in radon is extremely high, so what, what would you attribute it to? So what I showed you is actually the radon concentration in a coastal ocean, which depends actually not just how much groundwater flows in, but how much it's diluted, so what's the water level, plus how much mixing happens, how currents carry this radon away. So we can account for all those, yeah. and that does change over time. So um, the same amount of groundwater discharge would produce a much lower signature if there are high currents that take the radon away. And so we account for that in, in our model. We can estimate mixing losses. But otherwise, I would say even if we account for all those, that those records are still very, very variable. Okay, thank you. Thank you.